Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill us with your love today. Open our hearts and our minds to your word so that we not just hear the word, but we live it out. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. The other day I was driving uh, with my daughters in the car, and I love to play them music from when I grew up, 1980s, 1990s. And so I put on that song, I mean, I, I try to aim high, right? I put on Vanilla Ice, Ice Ice Baby. I know it has some Miami references in the song, and they really liked it, which was bizarre, right? So then we went from Ice Ice Baby, and I said, look, uh, you know, the same riff, the dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun, is in the, this other song, Under Pressure, which they were familiar uh, with as well. And then we had a vote, and unfortunately, they liked uh, Ice Ice Baby better than Under Pressure. But I was thinking about that song, Under Pressure. What made that song so popular back in the day? And I believe it's because it was that universal thing we all deal with, right? Pressure. We all experience it in our lives. And I know personally, as I've gotten older, it seems like the pressure uh, becomes greater. I remember getting married and uh, my wife started learning about the way I deal with pressure. And some of it, unfortunately, was not always healthy. We were buying our first car and it wasn't a Lamborghini. It was a Honda Civic, right? So we go to the car dealer. We had been to several car dealers. We had been back and forth. And finally, it's time to just close the deal, right? We got the price we wanted. We had done all the research. And I look at Veronica and I said, you know what? I think I need more information. I need more time. And she's looking at me. It was like, how much more information do you need? So we you know, went to the other room, had the other conversation. Finally, we pulled the trigger, bought the car, and it was fine. It was a great first car for our family, right? But so often... Um, I found for myself personally, when I have these big decisions, whether it's buying a car or a house, that I freeze up. I have trouble making those decisions. Fortunately, God put a uh, woman in my life who helps me once I have all the information to just make the decision and move forward. But I think all of us have those pressures in life with it's kind of that should I stay or should I go moment, right? Whether it's a challenging relationship, a financial struggle, an unstable job, you know, toxic work environment, whether to move to a new city or to stay where you're at, to buy that condo or to keep running. All of us are familiar with these everyday kind of pressures that we experience. But most of us, unfortunately, have experienced much more than these kind of pressures. Most of us have lived through some kind of trauma in our lives where we still feel the fallout from going through this uh, traumatic event. And it impacts oftentimes our life in many negative ways. For many of us, we don't always, always know how to react in helpful ways when we go through these kind of situations, whether it's the everyday pressures or these uh, bigger traumas that we go through. We tend to try to uh, run away from the problems or perhaps we freeze up like I did. And unfortunately, neither of those are great ways to deal with our problems, right? So what do we do with these pressures we experience? Whether it's the everyday kind of pressures or the uh, trauma that sometimes we go through. Well, the good news for us today is that God is not only familiar with the pressures, the struggles, our, our everyday challenges, but also our traumatic events that we experience. God's not only, not only familiar with these that, that are going on in our lives, he knows everything about us. And he offers us a better way through these difficulties. And we're going to learn more about that today by looking once again at this church in Thessalonica. The church in Thessalonica had experienced all kinds of pressure from the persecution and struggles of being a minority religion that uh, affected many different areas of their life from commerce to where they lived. Um, to actually more violent persecution that they went through and were continuing to go through. These pressures and trauma, if not handled right, had the potential to derail this church and even destroy it from the inside out, from fulfilling its mission. The Apostle Paul and the other writers of the letters of the New Testament were on a mission to encourage the churches all over the Roman Empire, like this one in Thessalonica, so they would not only uh, survive, but they would thrive. As we look at our passage today in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, uh, verses 6 through 13, we're going to see in this pastoral letter from uh, Paul that his message was not only relevant 
to how this church could survive the pressure and trauma they were experiencing. But his words speak to us today in our personal lives and in our church communities. Well, let's begin by looking at a little more closely at this church in Thessalonica. This church had started out strong. It, it was in an area that was very strategic. I think that's one of the reasons Paul wrote two letters to this church. There was right by the water. There was a lot of commerce and trade. There was people coming from all over the known world to this area in Thessalonica. But unfortunately, uh, the church, uh, again, was experiencing trauma through persecution. It was experiencing a lot of pressure. It was very vulnerable, unfortunately, to start listening to the wrong voices. And in some case, these false teachers were starting to bring up bad habits in this church that had spread it up among them and were leading this church away from its mission. And as a result, some people in the church had become lazy. And the word that we use to translate is idlers. And that's not like worshiping idols. Idlers, you got to think of a car. You know, if you don't have it in gear, it's an idol, right? The car's making a lot of noise but it's not really going anywhere. And that's what was going on in this community. It was making a lot of noise. People were complaining. People weren't working, but it was not moving. It was not fulfilling the great commission of going and making disciples. It was not living up to the potential of all that it could be. So why was this happening? Well, first of all, there were some teachers we learn about uh, in both letters in the Thessalonians who had told uh, this church that the end had already come, that Jesus had already come back. Perhaps this church was struggling so much because they'd been left behind. Or Jesus was about to come back. It was going to happen any day now. So some among the congregation perhaps had listened to these voices, to these teachings, and it was an excuse to not work. So this is why Paul writes, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers and sisters, to keep away from every, every believer who is idle and disruptive and does not live according to the teaching you receive from us. Paul let the church know, yes, Jesus was coming back, but this was an excuse. This was no excuse to not work. Perhaps you have heard the phrase, so focused on heaven that they're no earthly good. Well, that's exactly what Paul was talking about. This was no reason, even if Jesus was coming back any moment now, the church had an obligation to fulfill its mission, to make disciples, to work hard, to do what any uh, good community was supposed to do. There's another possibility that was causing these people to become idle, to not work. Perhaps they had uh, this whole practice in the Roman Empire that they were a part of, of Roman patronage. And this is where if you had status, you didn't do any physical labor. It was considered demeaning. You hired people to do that kind of work. It's kind of like having a personal assistant. And hey, if you had money, this was not necessarily not bad in and of itself. But the problem was it was abused in the Roman Empire. Oftentimes, they got these personal sense, uh, assistants to do uh, corrupt things for them, like cheat on their taxes or arrange affairs, arrange liaisons. This led to disordered personal lives. So perhaps the community had gotten this whole idea from the Romans of like, work is bad. Whatever the reason, whether it was cultural or whether it was thinking that uh, Jesus was going to come back any hour, any day now, or had already come back, it wasn't leading to good things. These idlers were taking advantage of Mediterranean hospitality, the idea that the community took care of each other. And in the church, the early believers in Christ, this was incredibly strong because Jesus' message of loving and serving one another, they took it seriously. And you add that to whole, the whole idea of the Mediterranean uh, culture of really loving and caring for the neighbor, it enhanced it. It magnified this whole idea. But now we had people that just wanted to be served. They didn't want to serve. They wanted to eat food, but they didn't want to work. And it was causing chaos in the community. In addition to uh, not working, the community was involved with something else. They were becoming busybodies. In other words, they were minding everybody else's business and not their own. Paul writes, we hear that some among you are idle and disruptive. These people are not busy, he writes, they are busy bodies. So what is, actually, what is this word busy bodies? Busy bodies, were, they were busy talking about anyone else but taking care of their own body, right? Paul understood if the church was going to be a healthy body, they needed to build up one another and not tear each other down. 
this practice of idleness and bi um, being busybodies was doing the opposite. You know, you don't become a somebody. The church was not going to become impactful if it was being a busybody, right? And you're, they were going to become a nobody because nobody wants to be around a, either a person or a community of people that's just gossiping and tearing each other down. This problem of idleness and uh, being busy, not busybodies had crept into this church community. People had, were not working. They were using each other and becoming busybodies. The church had become frozen. It was stuck and it needed a way forward. Well, being a good uh, pastor, Paul uses this letter not only to talk about the problem, but to provide solutions. The first thing he said, he said, was to be imitators of what you've seen from us. See, Paul traveled with a group of other missionaries. He said to, the, to this church, he said, keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive and does not live according to the teaching you receive from us. See, these early apostles um, had directly been impacted by Christ's life and words. They were changed from the inside out. They had, they had seen it. They had seen the risen Jesus. And they were charged with carrying out his mission, the Great Commission, as a way of life. And when Paul, the Apostle Paul, joined their ranks, he continued in this trajectory of moving the gospel forward. Paul and these early church leaders understood Jesus' words and actions and mission were to be the foundation of every church. And when they were carried out, there would, there would be harmony, purpose, which, which would help the church thrive, especially as they experienced pressure and trauma. But when the wrong voices were listened to, it could result in chaotic, not only chaotic personal lives, but it could destroy these churches, as I said before, from the inside out. So that's why he said, live according to the teaching that you receive from us. Not only the teaching of Christ, but also the way we lived our lives as leaders, as missionaries to you. He says, therefore, to the, uh, the church in, the, in Ephesus, Paul said these words, therefore be imitator, imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God. So Paul then goes on to write, look, for you yourselves know how you ought, and which was a very strong word, but it, was, it had actually a much stronger connotation in the original Greek, to follow our example. In other words, this isn't option A, or you might want to do this, or it could be a good idea from your life. No, Paul said, you ought to do this. You have to do this. He says, listen, we were not idle when we were among you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling so that we would not be a burden to any, to any of you. We did this not because we do not have the right to such help, because as missionaries coming in, they could have said, hey, we deserve a meal, right? But in order to offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate. Paul wants them to imitate the teaching he told them about Christ. He wants to imitate the way of life, their way of working hard. But Paul, being a good pastor, not only writes to the people that are being impacted by these people who are uh, lazy and causing trouble among them, he also wants to restore those very people that are being idle. He says this, such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the food they keep. He's constantly encouraging not only those who are impacted by the problem, but the people who are the problem makers. And finally, he ends this segment with these words. And as for you, brothers and sisters, never tire of doing what is good. In other words, keep going, persevere, don't give up. Don't let this setback we've had with the laziness and talking too much derail you. Let's all get back on track. We have a mission to do, the Great Commission to live out uh, the faith, to go and make disciples of all uh, nations, to not give up. You know, I was thinking about this passage, Paul's words of encouragement to be imitators of us. And it reminded me of a, a chef show I saw on Netflix. You know, they have a lot of them on there. In this particular show, the guy was a, um, a very talented young chef, and he got a job with this um, 
very expensive restaurant that had an incredible uh, reputation in the Midwest. It was one of those kind of Michelin rated, uh, you know, uh, restaurants. Anyway, he gets in the environment there and he's working with all these other chefs. And he said it was cutthroat. He said everybody was out to get one another, to step on one another, to try to get known so they could build their resume, right? And he said the top chef who was one of his heroes was just a nightmare <coughs> to work with. Again, very toxic kind of environment. So he quit. Everybody said, you're crazy. How can you quit this restaurant? So he ended up doing a research and went to a much smaller restaurant in a different part of the country, but had an incredible reputation. The, the chef was, uh, was known all over the world and he was a little gun shy as he went in thinking, okay, I don't want another bad experience. So he goes into this restaurant and he sees this man mopping the floor. And he's like, well, it's probably the custodian or one of the kitchen staff. So he asked the guy mopping the floor where the, you know, this head chef is. And the guy's like, well, that would be me. And so he just talks, starts talking to him like a regular person. And as he, um, he ended up getting a job with the guy, the guy hired him. And it was an incredible experience for him because the guy modeled what a healthy restaurant looks like, what a healthy company looks like. He was a servant. He didn't just tell people to go do this and do that. He did it too, the head chef. And that became part of this young chef's DNA. That when he finally went to and started his own restaurant, he didn't remember the stuff from the first restaurant. He remembered the second, the mopping the floor. And he brought that same culture into his new restaurant and his restaurant became incredibly successful. You see, the people who worked there started imitating what the head chef was doing, just like he had learned at the healthy restaurant he went to. So as Paul wrote these letters uh, through the various churches, and, and specifically to this one in Thessalonica that had the influx of laziness, idleness, and uh, these people just talking way too much and gossiping, he had a mission too. He wanted this church to become healthy and not toxic, to not be derailed, but to thrive. This was his mission. This is why he wrote the letter. He didn't want them to become frozen or to just quit and say, we're done. He wanted them to get back to the right path. So what does this message from Paul to the Church of Thessalonica have to do with you? Well, I think it is a reminder for all of us, particularly you today, as you go through the daily pressures, as you experience trauma, to listen to the right voice. Whether your reaction is uh, to freeze up or to maybe want to run away, there's a better way. And that's the way of faith. You know, what is faith? Because that's a pretty churchy word, right? Faith is when we put all of our weight on God's promises. It's like jumping both feet into the pool, trusting our lives and saying yes to God. See, when we do this, we're reminded that we're not alone. God fills us with the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and he puts a community of believers around us. We call it the church, the body of believers. And we have clear instructions together to be imitators of God as beloved children, to walk in love as Christ also loved and gave himself for us, just as I, uh, that when Paul wrote to the Ephesians those words. So we're reminded that we're not alone. We have a mission that we carry out together. When you say yes to Christ, when you put your whole faith, your whole self in, you're not disappointed. You have a way forward as you deal with pressure and trauma. The writer of Proverbs wrote these words and says, as iron sharpens iron, so one of us sharpens another. We sharpen one another as we go through difficulties. The writer of Hebrews said, let us not give up meeting together, together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage each other. We're called to meet together, to share our burdens with each other, as in Galatians, in Paul's letter to the Galatians, when he writes, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. The way of faith helps us as not only we deal with the pressures from everyday life, but as we go through trauma, that we walk with it together. And for our church, it's a reminder, these, uh, this uh, passage in Thessalonians, that we too are called not to be derailed, not to become lazy in doing what Christ has called us to, not to become busybodies and gossips, but instead to become engaged 
with Christ, with his words, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And as we're engaged and filled, that we go out and share the love we have with Christ to the world. In other words, we put our faith in practice. We're imitators of what we have seen in Christ, what we have seen in other believers, and we put it into practice. When we do this, we are at our best. We're no longer a church that is uh, just talking about a bunch of stuff but not doing anything. We're no longer a church that is gossiping and uh, telling each other about what this person or that person did, but another, we're carrying each other's burdens and helping each other to live out the faith. You know, I was thinking recently, I watched a, that NFL game that many of us who even weren't football players saw it in the game where the player for the Bills, Hamlin, um, had a heart attack on the field. He had to be brought back to life with CPR. It led people, even newscasters live, to pray. Football players, growing men, these big, strong guys had tears in their eyes and people were praying for him. And fortunately, this story had a great ending on this side of heaven. Heron Hamlin came back to life. He was resuscitated. Um, he's still in recovery, but doing great. But as we got to know this guy, we understood that he was a believer, that he had raised an incredible amount of money for charity. And because of this uh, tragedy, this trauma that he experienced, millions of dollars were donated to his charity. You see, this incident is really what church is all about. Yes, we go through pressure. We go through sometimes traumatic events like happened this NFL event, but it leads us to pray. It leads us to trust in God even more with our lives. And it leads us to give, to not live lives where it's just about us. The church is best when it's engaged and when it's in motion. That's what it was designed to do. Let's not miss out on this great, this great opportunity, this great calling for us not to just endure, but to never tire of doing good, to be engaged with the world. In the Gospels, Jesus said these words in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Let us pray. Lord God, we need you. We can't do church. We can't do life very well without you. Lord God, we all experience pressure. We experience trauma. But you are with us in that. You have called us to be a part of a body of believers who carries our burdens, who sharpen each other, and who love each other. Lord God, help us to not get in the habit of not meeting together, but let us encourage one another to be Christians who are engaged with you and engaged with the world. Help us to carry out the Great Commission through your power. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.